That's awesome. wonderful. Great. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. You know, in terms of, I guess, just like how you start start working with this. I mean, um, I don't know. Like, had you, like, just in your practice as a, you know, as a psychologist and um, psychotherapist, like, have you like dealt much with, um, you know, I don't know, integrating like smells or this kind of like immersion therapy sort of stuff uh, prior to working with the, no absolutely with this OBR stuff? i can you know to, to sum up the the whole process i could say this psychotherapy works wonderfully as long as the patient is willing to listen to you interact with you um and so in other words it doesn't matter how good you are as a psychologist psychotherapist psychiatrist if the person does not want to interact with you you you, you cannot really provide a lot of help except when you're addressing the issues starting from a more basal neurological level so long story short if you use psychotherapy, most of the brain areas that you you will be using, you know, beside you know audio stimulation, will be related to cognition, so prefrontal cortex, words. Versus if you work with other things, and smell will be the primary way to address that, you almost completely bypass that um, that um, inner um, filter, so to speak, the thalamus, so to speak. And so I've been working with these integrated methodologies for I think at this point 15, 20 years spanning from smell and taste and movement. And the general idea is this, um, a lot of psychological issues that people experience are not due to their uh, mistakes in thinking, although that still plays a big part and that's precisely why psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy still plays a major role. But there are situations where you still understand what you ought to do, but your whole sense of self does not follow. So using the sense of smell, bypasses your over rationalization which can turn into rumination and brings you to that situation in the inside and the outside which will be preferred to feel better so it's like experiencing something without someone explaining it to you it's a difference between reading a poem about love and falling in love if that makes sense yeah oh that makes sense that's that's a that's a really that's a really interesting way to put that what did you use you know to sort of trigger, uh, I mean, you know, sort of smell and stuff like that before uh, before the VR headset and all that. Yeah, well, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Now, now one of the, the main elements within integrative methodologies is using um, smell in the sense of aromatherapy or herbal medicine and aromatherapy. So we use, we use essential oils during, for instance, meditative practices. But of course, the idea there is while the same molecules that you use you know, in this essential oil still, still trigger the same areas, the olfactory nerves, and, 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 and they, they impact those areas that are responsible for the flight and flight response of the amygdala, then the person still needs to, so to speak, motivate themselves in order to use the smells. Okay? Um, versus with olfactory virtual reality, the neat thing about that is that you combine both visual processing elements with olfactory elements at the same time. Um, and also, I would say, audio stimulation as well in the case of OVR. So, um, to just to give you a little bit of a context, uh, what happened is that um, we use aromatherapy before, and in fact, aromatherapy has been used for centuries, and there are different ways to define what aromatherapy is, if, you know, to be more specific, whether it's just a part of herbal medicine or, or a green alchemy, as they say, spagyrics, etc., etc. Uh, but the general idea is that you use smell in order to calm yourself down, so to speak to kind of feel less stressed. And, and of course, that doesn't necessarily trigger uh, the specifics of the diagnosis, depression, etc. but at least it produces a general environment of safety for the person, okay? But um, we always integrated that with physical exercise. Now, the problem with that is we cannot choose to treat people that only suffer from psychological disorders and not from physical disorders. So if a person is bedridden, in their room, that it's hard for us to provide the same level of therapy with both aromatherapy or exercise, because of course they cannot perform as well, biologically speaking. And so olfactory virtual reality kind of helps on both sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it helps understanding oneself without thinking about it, being brought to a new environment, and triggers the brain in a very similar way as if you were quote unquote smelling the roses and interacting with the environment um and so it's, it's it's a whole package now the other thing that was really neat is that the research started right before covid and went through covid 
And so we had other elements that were very useful for us to test because besides using um, um, questionnaires and surveys, we of course kept monitoring patient vitals. It's kind of the essence of any uh, inpatient psychiatry in any, any unit in, in any hospital really. And so you, you were able to add some numbers to their values. What does it mean? It means that um, if we only monitor stress level, for instance, you know, you know, cortisol will be a good indicator. If we want to monitor anxiety, then you can focus on heart rate or oxygenation rate, etc. But then you have to combine that with what the person feels about the situation. And so that's the last thing. If you are in psychotherapy, there might be an implicit bias where the person might say works for them just to please you. Or if you just work with aromatherapy, you might not actually be able to trigger the same mechanism simply because if you use an essential oil, that the essential oil is, so to speak, deprived from the context. The person needs to uh, come up with their own imaginative powers to link the smell of whatever it is, lavender, to the plant, right? Versus with olfactory virtual reality, these two things happen simultaneously. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so it's sort of like a little bit more of like um, I mean, I guess you're able to sort of control the experience a little bit more versus like, you know, guided meditation, for example, or like, um, you know, it's like, hey, smell this and imagine this. And then it's sort of like, you know, you might get someone who's like, just sort of like, yeah, definitely, definitely imagining this, you know, and, and just, you know, sort of, yes, and like you said, sort of saying that to like, because that's what they think they're supposed to be saying. Yes, and there's another element which is a more on a theoretical or even philosophical perspective. One of the issues that sometimes a person might encounter during standard, this is really an oxymoron, but standard alternative practices, so aromatherapy and meditation, um, is that with meditation, the general idea, it's an idea that's somewhat misconstructed, the idea of emptying one's mind to focus on the here and now. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but you can imagine a person struggling with depression, intrusive thoughts, suicidality. It's easier said than done for me to tell you, just empty your mind with meditation. So the person might be jittery, might be anxious, might not be actually, you know, doing anything with meditation, just waiting for the meditation practice to be over. So to some extent, it's very different from something that will be more active. For instance, let's say a prayer or reciting a mantra. But now, of course, you cannot use necessarily prayer and reciting a mantra because that will be uh, uh, expecting the person to have the same system of beliefs as the other person in the room. Yeah. So yet again, with olfactory virtual reality, you kind of skip all these elements. You don't expect a person to empty their thoughts. Their thoughts will be filled by the sensory motor elements. So again, I'm not suggesting that meditation and aromatherapy alone are not useful. They're extremely useful, but so is you know, psychotherapy and prayer. But this is something quite different in itself. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, what are um, so? I mean, what are some of the um, uh, scenarios where you would use this? Is it primarily like in your own? Like, do you use this in your own practice? And like, how so? Is it primarily like a, a meditation tool you see, or are there other like um, uh, other other you know sort of treatments or therapies that you uh, you see it being used for? I would say that the it's a developmental process uh, in a sense that um, the, the neat thing is that this type of technology will be able to bridge the gap from something that is otherwise not really helpful versus something that is really therapeutically effective. The thing that's not be helpful will be uh, for a person, that, and this is actually the case that I'm, I'm dealing with on a daily basis with my patients, um, and they, they have this kind of inner split. On one side, they sit down with me and we talk about you know, issues and diagnosis and triggers and whatnot. So it's, it's mostly focused on psychotherapy. And of course, there's a whole pharmacological intervention. And then they find ways to relax, for instance, by playing video games or watching TV or being on the internet. And again, this is a form of passive relaxation, which really is not that helpful uh, if for no other reasons, because you don't have the the proper way to filter out information. So something you can find on the internet might be, you know, relaxing to you, but then there are things that might be even more triggering to you. Not only that, but relying on that type of pre-packaged information deprives your own brain from creating new scenarios uh, on one side, 
Uh, so it makes the brain more, for lack of a better term, lazy to create new scenarios because they've been prepackaged to you. And on the other side, you might not even know what you need anymore. You start to believe that reality is what the internet projects to you. Versus if you have a more active role, and if you are the one putting the gangles on, and you're the one deciding, so there's a choice element, to embark on a reality that's still virtual, you're fully aware of that, then the choice informs your well-being in general. Now, this is something that I really talk quite a bit, you know, in, in my lectures and in workshops, um, is this general <laughs> misconception um, about science um, that it's important to, to discuss whenever you talk about technology. Um, you could say that technological advances are fundamental for what we do, especially in my field within neuroscience and psychiatry. We know so much more nowadays than we knew only five years ago. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I have to make the statement that science appears to forget more than what it discovers at this point. And I want to give a few examples. So, um, it has to be clear that using this type of technology, uh, whether they're digital technologies on their own or the association of digital technology plus virtual reality or virtual reality plus, you know, motor cortex and, you know, sensory motor simulation, they have to be used not as a substitute, but as an enhancing um, process. Yeah. So, from the perspective of, of well-being, um, a, let, let me put it this way, a video might be more enhancing in itself than reading a book, and reading a book might be more enhancing as typing the book or handwriting the book. But from the perspective of what actually the person needs to develop, writing something, handwriting something, is so much more effective than anything that is predicated on technology. We have this knowledge for now 50 years and more and more research is coming out. So whenever we use a new technology, we have to be extremely clear that there must be a reason for this new technology to be utilized. Otherwise, the danger is that you will obtain the opposite result. You will impair the person's ability to create new reality. Now, and I conclude, so in other words, uh, would be, um, if the question is, is virtual reality or olfactory virtual reality useful for the average person? Well, it can be useful as any other type of entertainment. It's more useful for patients, simply because patients, especially within you know, mood and personality disorders or depression, um, are at baseline deprived from some of the strength that the brain has to create new scenarios. So olfactory virtual reality helps them bridge the gap. Gotcha. So it sort of like makes it, it's like if someone is sort of like having just as, yeah, as a basic level, just like having a harder time, like engaging with like day to day life, um, you know, then this can be a way to sort of bring them up to speed. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the other only thing is, is kind of to, you know, to add a little more to your question was, so how do you just use this in an everyday, you know, situation? Well, um, the general assumption that I think we should make, especially in the Western world, in the U.S., is that um, people in general spend less and less time connected to their inner self or connected to nature. So using an olfactory virtual reality process that allows you to interact in a natural environment, in the woods, for instance, actually help, helps that. Because the other thing that it can be extremely dangerous is a person, um, a, a random person suffering from, let's say, low self-esteem and depressive problems, with say, tell you, might relate to the world with a filter on part of which is of course you know what's happening in their brain but the biggest part of it is what type of message the person is exposed to on a daily basis from you know friends in the best case scenarios <laughs> from internet and other media in the worst case scenario and so again i'm, I'm not trying to put to, to picture a, a, a scenario where everything is negative, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not cynical about the future. Uh, I'm simply stating that you as a person might not even know how much of your sense of self is being choked, being deprived of vital energy, because you start to believe that what you see is the ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. and, and so you might, you, you might create a scenario where you feel more depressed, paradoxically speaking, than you really are, um, the best example would be um, being too consumed by appearing a certain way on the media, for instance. Okay? And by media, I don't necessarily mean you know, big media, even mean like likes. I mean, everybody's subjected to that. I mentioned this a few times. 
um, just as a random person might be obsessed with, let's say, likes on Facebook or Twitter, a scientist right, might right. be obsessed with, with, with I don't know, uh, r uh, research points, okay, or, or citations. So it's something that, that, and so if you, you might be completely fine until someone brings to your attention the fact that, well, there's someone else that has, has it better than me, and that kind of crushes your, your identity. Versus, again, nature itself is non-judgmental. That's the point. Um, and so, um, I guess, like, where do you see this technology going? Like, how, like, what do you think needs to happen to make it more useful for, um, for you know, therapists and, and sort of like more widespread, I guess? What do you think needs to happen to make this sort of, um, this sort of tech like more, uh, you know, accessible, I guess, um, and and used more and and like. What do you see being used more for in the future? Um, I, I think the part of that... <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, part of it, I think, is already happening. I'm, I'm pretty sure that OVR, it's, uh, as a company itself, uh, it's working on it. Uh, one, one thing is to become more of your own actor, or master, or creator. And anything they're doing that, they have something like a OVR sense studio, I believe they call it which allows the person to to uh, create their own uh, aromas, their own digital smells, uh, digital aromas. Uh, and so they can combine these aromas with other interfaces, with, with, with audio stimulation and video stimulation. So that, that is good because it allows the person to be creative yet again. So what is being deprived from your creativity, uh, because it's a, it's a digital, it's a virtual scenario, is reincorporated because you're the one creating this multi-sensorial pattern so that is one area that can be used in a variety of settings not just clinical i mean i'm biased because that, that's 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 my research and clinical areas so i always interested in neuroscience and psychology the most uh, but that can have a variety of application for instance in in the movie industry for instance so entertainment industry in general um to to allow a person to experience a concert for instance in a more uh multi-dimensional manner so that's that's one area and there are other areas. Um, I recently gave an interview to uh, this, this company, which is called Sand Tech. It's a company in Latvia and Norway, in Europe, and they created a sand camera. Uh, so the idea is not just to experience an olfactory virtual reality scenario, but you can take a smell picture at the same time as you record a video or you record an audio image. So. Uh, OVR, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful company, but it's, it's a movement that is happening around the world. Uh, m maybe towards Sense Camera, maybe U Europe is a little ahead of us. Um, but, it, but in any case, there's a lot of development um, that allow uh, to, to uh, put the pictures back together. The puzzle has been broken. Um, and this is a metaphor I use all the time when I talk about mental health issues. If, if your identity, if your sense of self is disintegrated, it's disconnected, it's dissociated. Our job is to reconnect, reintegrate the picture, to recombine the puzzle. But of course, words only go so far because you have to pay attention to it, especially with someone with a thick accent like myself. And so if you can use senses to do that, we'll, this will also help treat something that's been triggering in the past. So especially in the context of taking a smell pictures, that you can be brought up to a new scenario, health scenario, anytime you choose, so to speak. So I think that's one potential that will impact not just healthcare, but the entertainment industry and um, digital developments in general. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, cool, great. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time today. You've been very, very helpful. Well, anyway, um, yeah, Dr. Tomasi, it was really wonderful talking with you, and um, looking forward to uh, to seeing you in person. Wonderful. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Take care. Have a you good too. Bye-bye.